My name is Elena Silva, and on behalf of New America, our education team, and especially our team here dedicated to improving the recruitment, preparation, and support of our nation's educators, we thank you for joining us here today. Uh, as you may know, Grow Your Own Educator programs are an increasingly popular strategy for alleviating teacher shortages. We see investments across the country in GYO and other related approaches, including teacher apprenticeships and residencies to increase and diversify the educator workforce. Um, how do we know, how do we ensure that GYO programs are well-designed, that they're high impact for candidates and for students, and that they're sustainable? Uh, we're gonna dig into that today. We're gonna hear from two panels of experts on the opportunities, challenges of GYO programs, as well as useful resources for supporting GYO program development. So let's get started. I'm passing it over to you, Raven. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm Raven Dorena Spires, um, the Grow Your Own Educators National Network Coordinator here at New America. Um, today's event was born out of the recent release, if you've seen it, our GYO Toolkit, um, a collection of resources meant to help GYO program practitioners navigate the many aspects of program implementation, um, including design and funding, uh, candidate recruitment and support, um, advocacy and program evaluation. Today's agenda is also organized in a similar way um, that will allow us to dig a little bit deeper into the challenges and opportunities related to these topics. Um, I do wanna say that all of our um, resources that I've mentioned, including our GYO toolkit um, will be shared after this webinar so you can have access to them. Um, today we'll have two panels. Uh, the first moderated panel discussion will focus on the what of GYO, uh, what it is, why it's getting so much attention. And then the second panel will focus on how GYO looks in practice. Um, during today's session, uh, please feel free to drop your questions um, in the Q&A box to the right. Uh, we'll have time at the end of the webinar uh, for a few minutes of Q&A with our panelists. And then also, um, please feel free to tweet about this event um, you can use the hashtags GYO Toolkit, uh, hashtag GYO Educators, or uh, hashtag New America Ed. And then our program handle on Twitter is at New America Ed. Um, I'll go ahead and jump right in, turn it, to our, uh, turn it over to our first moderator, Alex Manuel, to begin our first panel. Hi, great to see everyone today. Um, my name is Alexandra Manuel. I'm an advisor with the New America's Grow Your Own Network. Um, I'm looking forward to moderating the panel today with some incredible panelists with uh, much to share with you about Grow Your Own and the opportunity and challenges within educator preparation. Our panelists include Tiffany Kane, Senior Policy Analyst at the National Education Association, Dr. Conrad Gist, uh, Associate Professor of Teaching and Teacher Education at the University of Houston, and Amaya Garcia, Deputy Director of Pre-K-12 Education at New America. And um, to help ground our conversation, I would like to begin with a discussion of what Grow Your Own is and how each of you would define and think about the term. Uh, Amaya, let's start with you. Sure, thanks Alex, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, so we've thought about this quite a bit um, in the research that we've done because GYO is such a local strategy. For the most part, there hasn't been like a unified definition of, of what it means. So to us, we define Grow Your Own as partnerships between um, educator preparation programs, school districts, and our community-based organizations that recruit and prepare local community members. So these can be paraeducators, it could be high school students, they could even be parents, um, to become teachers in their local schools. I also have started talking a lot about Grow Your Own as a sort of recruitment frame because now we have all these new models emerging and people kind of aren't sure like what the differences are between an apprenticeship, between residency, between Grow Your Own. And so Grow Your Own for us really is that idea that you're recruiting from the community for the community and you're making sure that your community has you know well prepared teachers that meet the needs of students but also understand the realities of the communities and the schools that they work in. Thanks, Amaya. Tiffany or Conra, would you like to, to add to that? I yeah, I can I can build off of that. I think so I guess I'll start off like uh Amaya. Wait, let me first say thank you so much for organizing this panel. I'm really kind of honored and excited to be on this. 
Um, so I think I'll start off with the, just a classic definition of, you know, grow your own programs are designed to recruit, uh, prepare. And then I would also add place community members um, to become teachers through partnerships between educator preparation programs, school districts, and local educational agencies and community-based organizations. So I think that's kind of just a very um, broad definition. In my own work, I've been particularly interested in Grow Your Own programs that have uh, explicit commitments to justice, uh, because if you look at sort of the historical origins of using this term of Grow Your Own, not just the kind of renaissance that the term is experiencing right now, but historically, there's been this kind of explicit um, justice commitment and so I guess I would add to, in terms of thinking about how to define some of what um, Amaya was just alluding to, because there's all these different branches of apprenticeships and so on, to me is thinking about, well, what is the kind of um, teaching and learning orientation that's really shaping and driving the Grow Your Own program? Um, so on the one hand, we're sort of talking about recruitment, um, but what is the what is the orientation that, that's shaping the design? So what I mean by that is, does it have just an explicit academic focus? And are they thinking that Grow Your Own programs recruit folks from the community and then just absorb them in traditional teacher education programs? Um, is there kind of a very explicit um, commitment to um, justice, for example, making sure that the, the partnership is designed in such a way to challenge some of the equities inequities that we know exist um, in, in traditional teacher education? Um, you know, does it have more um, of a technological focus in terms of the orientation, meaning that it's looking at whether or not they hit particular benchmarks or evidence excellence in particular types of ways, and that's how they view developing teachers. And so I, I say that in my kind of initial response, because I think part of it is if we get past the partnership dynamic, and if we get past the kind of focus on community, a lot of the work is really around what orientation is driving the teaching learning experiences of people who are in the programs. And so I think that that's really what complicates uh, the work in some way. Um, yeah, I agree with both and just to add on to it. Um, well, for one, obviously, I'm going to say that also a partner could be the local union or association, um, because a lot of times, um, both grow your own programs, you're recruiting education support professionals or paras into those programs who are members of the union. And um, we also believe that they're based on the needs of the community and the um, when you're thinking about like the targeted recruitment um, efforts and just um, that I'm trying to put my head to like what Connor is just saying because that was really interesting that if you're thinking about like the teaching and learning aspect of it all um, it's really important to consider the supports that are also needed for the candidates that are going through the programs. Yeah, uh, you all are highlighting different pieces. Um, and I think that is really interesting to think about the, the support and also thinking about the kind of orientation around um, uh, justice and, and, and really thinking about maybe going into our next question, which is, you know, why, why is Grow Your Own an important strategy right now, particularly? And how does it fit in with the current teacher preparation landscape? And uh, Tiffany, if we, we could begin with you and, and we'll hear from everyone. Um, yeah, I think for, it's obviously because, you know, there's a teacher shortage um, that we're all aware of and working on, but, and addressing that we're gonna require us to expand traditional pathways into the profession and Grow Your Own is a great strategy to do that. Um, as I mentioned, it's not just about like, recruiting potential teachers, but thinking about some of the members of the community, whether it's the school or external or high school students that you can tap into that are already invested and care about those communities. Um, if we're gonna solve the educator shortage, which NEA just released a new paper in connection with AFT, um, Grow Your Own is a great strategy to identify promising teacher candidates. Um, and also it's a way to improve diversity, you know, diversity benefits everyone and um, a strong grow your program, as Dr. Guest also mentioned, has the four elements of recruiting, preparing, placing and retaining. And a lot of times we 
we think about just the recruitment and the retention piece, but thinking about the entire pathway into teaching and making sure that the candidates are profession ready and that they have the tools and resources they need to become profession ready, which includes um, the different supports for the candidates, um, thinking about like paid payments while they're either if they're a para continuing their payment, like their salaries, sorry. And um, if a colleague and I were talking just recently about it, and if it was, you know, if you're thinking about like a high school program, um, and a lot of them do offer, C they use CTE credits, it could be that it's a work study so that they're actually getting paid similar to like when you do like hairstyle, barber schools, things like that. And I thought that was like a good, interesting idea. Um, and making sure that um, that it's affordable throughout the pathway. So whether you're partnering with the colleges and universities to provide um, different um, help or scholarships so that they're not coming out of pocket and sustainable for the candidates. Conrad, do you have some thoughts on on how this fits into the larger landscape on uh, as far as educator preparation? Yeah, I, I think that Tiffany actually nailed those points on the head in terms of just the the reasons why it's kind of relevant right now. Um, what it made me think about was um, a piece that I was working on in terms of um, how what grow your own programs have the potential to to do is to kind of shift the narrative around teacher development in general, which I think is important in addition to all the things that um, Tiffany just mentioned. And so um, again, this is, I, I preface this by saying potential, <laughs> it's not providential, like it's going to happen, um, but that, um, that grow your own programs because it's talking about recruiting folks from the community, the local geographic community and school community. And I also think about it as positioning or kind of bringing folks in the profession who, um, I think historically we've overlooked and haven't necessarily seen the genius that they have to bring and to offer the profession, that it gives us an opportunity to shift narratives by kind of looking at um, intersectional approaches to diversity, not necessarily just looking at it in, in one dimensional fashion, right? But thinking about, I think some of the numbers is that we have a high, high um, number of uh, bilingual paraprofessionals who can make a really strong contribution to the profession, right? Also thinking about the opportunity to bring in more males of color into the profession. Um, they also give us an opportunity, and I'm talking about shifting the narrative, uh, to really value resilience and, and people who have gone, gone through challenges but been able to kind of overcome. And the reason I mention that is I think sometimes when we think about teacher quality, we think about folks who score this, you know, this particular metric um, on a certification exam or are able to, to demonstrate this GPA. And I'm not saying that those things aren't valuable, but I think what GYO programs have to offer in some sense in terms of shifting the narrative is thinking about what other types of values, attributes, and features might grow your own candidates bring to the profession. So one of it, one of those, I think, is kind of connected to resilience. Um, I also think that in the context of what I just mentioned, we know that historically the the, the certification exams um, have been biased in terms of outcomes, right? And so I think that what grow your own programs do because there's such a large number of folks of color who are entering um, through these pathways is it pushes us to think about multiple modes of assessments for folks to be able to demonstrate excellence. So it's not, you know, uh, I think that there's a contingency and I know there's another panel coming up from GYO Illinois where there's well-documented evidence that folks were kind of failing, failing certification exams at a high number. And so they made some adjustments in terms of entrance exams and what folks were actually able to, um, had to take in order to enter the programs. And there was a significant um, difference in terms of folks who had access. So um, another thing that these programs do is they kind of shift the conversation potentially in terms of thinking about the kinds of assessments that we need to have in the profession. Um, and then they also really, I think, value kind of local and place-based learning in this process as well, and, and kind of look to value the contributions that local community-based teacher educators make. And so it's not just folks in teacher ed like myself who come through traditional pathways, but also thinking about folks from the community who can add 
um, value to these types of program designs. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is that kind of in addition to the like the basic kind of reasons why we know these programs matter and contribute to the landscape, I also think they give us an opportunity to kind of reimagine what's possible because we're dealing with a new um, kind of population of folks. Thank you. Maya, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, just really quickly, I want to add that they're also transforming the way that we think about who wants to become a teacher, because I think a lot of the narrative right now is that people don't want to enter teaching, but that's not necessarily true. We have a lot of people in our communities who have faced barriers to earning a degree, and so one of the strengths of Corey Rowan is that it can address those barriers, remove those barriers, and help people actually get through and get and get their certification. Um, I think the other thing that people don't think about a lot too is that grow your own is sort of an umbrella strategy, right? And there's lots of different kinds of models underneath that you can do a residency approach, you can yeah. do apprenticeship is like what's happening now, you can do a kind of like an alternative certification. And so there's some flexibility there that I think um, is beneficial for localities and for programs because they have that flexibility to be creative about how they're designing the program and how they're kind of um, making it also flexible for the candidates, because if you're working full time, you need to be able to take classes at a time that's convenient for you, etc. Um, and so that's kind of all I want to add, because Tiffany and Connor already said so many great things. Yeah, um, with appreciation for all of you for I think you all talked about kind of that strengths based approach and the values of, um, that are connected to like place based learning, as well as kind of what what does that um, does that design can be can can look different depending on the type of grow your own programs? So, I think one question that we hear a lot is, what does a high quality grow your own program look like? Um, and uh, Conrad, um, would you start us off with sharing some of the what that looks like to you? Yeah, I think. Um... I, I've been thinking a lot about this because I, there's um, because of this issue of trying to tease apart what are the distinctions between programs and in working on a piece recently where I landed was just kind of thinking about well what are kind of important important indicators for programs who are committed to community teacher development because to me part of the work is being committed to folks who are local and are from and invested in and committed to the community. So I think that's kind of a really important point. So in the context of what quality looks like for programs that are committed to community investment, I think part of it is making sure that there are structural supports that allow them to use the program as a vehicle for economic mobility. And what I mean by that, this is my positioning. I mean, there, there's so many different ways to think about it is that you have folks who are you know, kind of working on a pair of salary or maybe kind of working um, as classified staff in the context of the school all of a sudden that they're able to go through the program and actually you know, receive certification to become a teacher, that makes a, a huge difference in their life in terms of what they're able to do for their family, kind of how they're able to contribute to their community. And so one of the things that I kind of look at, and this is connected to um, a piece that I just did um, in equity and excellence in education, is thinking about, well, what are the structural indicators that show that a program is actually committed to supporting economic mobility in some way, shape, form, or fashion? Um, does the program actually have any sort of um, practices around kind of shifting policy? that have disenfranchised community members. So kind of looking at that. So it's not so much that you're recruiting folks from the community and we're just bringing them into the program and you're going to make it through. But what are you doing structurally different in terms, like some of the, like, you know, my and Tiffany have already mentioned in terms of allowing them to have paid internships when you're actually offering the courses. And then as I was mentioning, advocacy around what's happening with certification processes as well. Um, advocacy around how they're able to get um, a certain number of hours to do their student teaching and what that actually Actually looks like that that part of the work of the program in my view in terms of folks who are committed to the community is not so much to bring them in but to advocate against the things that cause them not to be able to be successful um, another part of that is kind of connected to evaluating of kind of cultural knowledge and interpersonal relationships so that there's some sort of valuing of the funds of knowledge and community cultural wealth that um, that folks are actually bringing into the grow your own program um, and so that's really about being seen uh, heard, 
uh, and affirmed and making sure that that, you know, that that comes across in the curriculum that's being taught and the teacher educators that are working with them in the schools that they're actually placed. And then the relational component is making sure that the power is really connected, not just kind of at the university level, but at the community level. And I think in, in connecting um, to what Tiffany was saying, that that in partnership could be with unions and community-based organizations to figure out how you're really advocating for local-based needs. And so to me, um, I know my colleagues will kind of answer probably in a different way. It's it, it's kind of pushing the conversation to say, if you're really committed to community educators, what are these different aspects um, that that you want to, you know, kind of put your money and investment behind? Because to me, I think that's what's going to allow grow your own programs to truly be distinct and not just become another reproduction of traditional teacher education programs. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense in terms of you know, what are the unique um, or innovative attributes that that designed that really center around who you, who we're, who we're trying to serve? Um, Tiffany, um, Amaya, would you like to add to that? Um, uh, okay. Oh, God. I'm oh, sorry. Um, only just to add that um, or emphasize the centering of the community in, in all of this and thinking through um, how we're gonna change the narrative, you know, cause it's often, um, you know, educators, they're paid bad, they're overworked. And, but as I think it was Amaya who said that there's still plenty of people that wanna be teachers and there's people that wanna be teachers that never thought they could be. And I think that gives them, an, Grow Your Own gives them an opportunity to not only pursue it, but to see themselves as, potential educators. Um, and just again, stressing like making sure that they have the supports in place, whether it's um, paying them, making sure that they have, you know, bringing the courses to the schools where they're already working, making it convenient and accessible. And it also gives um, current teachers an opportunity to whether they're a teacher leader, um, they're, you know, resident teacher, um, but it it gives them something else to kind of maybe hang on there of like a few more years, you know, if they're thinking about quitting, like giving some new life and breath into the profession that they're already in. Great. And, and Amaya, maybe building up on that, do you see um, that looking different across different types of Grow Your Own programs in terms of uh, apprenticeships or residencies or, um, you know, uh, Anything you want to add to share a little bit more about um, from all of the writing that you've done uh, about programs across the country? Yeah, so something I think about sometimes is is how that grow your own teacher feels on day one in the classroom. So I've gotten to visit quite a few programs and heard from GYO program graduates who are in programs that were more residency oriented. So they spent two years working as a paraeducator under a mentor teacher while they were in their um, classwork, right? And they always would tell me, you know, on my first day, I didn't feel like a first year teacher, right? Like I felt like I had experience. It wasn't like, I didn't have to deal with some of those adjustments that first year teachers have, right? And so I think that's, you know, one marker of, of a quality program is how those candidates feel on, on day one in the classroom when they're leading. Um, we have also done work based on like all the research we've done and with the help of some um, external experts and advisors thought about, well, what are these sort of like essential elements that we want to see present in every Grow Your Own program? Um, and I'll just kind of say those very briefly. So one would obviously be the partnerships. Um, I know in your own work um, in Washington State, Alex, that was a big driver of the work and the grant program was to really incentivize those partnerships between all the stakeholders who are invested um, and engage with developing teachers. It can't just be done by educator preparation programs alone. There has to be that alignment and commitment from multiple parties to make sure that the teachers are well equipped and, and understand the needs of, of kids. Um, but we also talk about, you know, intentional recruitment of linguistically and racially diverse candidates. For us, this work actually grew out of work that we were doing looking at how to develop the bilingual teacher um, pipeline and the challenges that people face who maybe don't speak English as a first language, but are still qualified and interested in becoming educators. Um, 
The third would really be those wraparound supports. We think that's really, really an important component of this and something that sets where you're on apart from other kinds of models of teacher preparation. And those can be, you know, very comprehensive. One way that I like to think about them is you kind of have that navigator who's helping you along your whole path. It's very one-to-one. -one. Um, there's someone who kind of has your back and is helping you make sure that you're hitting all those benchmarks along the way so that you are successful in, in earning your degree. And obviously the financial supports are, are really essential. Um, but then also having cohort models, having really strong academic advising, having tutoring, having test preparation, kind of all those different pieces that can come into play in supporting candidates. Um, we also talk a lot about uh, paid on the job learning, which we think is really important and obviously really aligns with this new movement towards apprenticeship. And then lastly, I think actually having a structured pathway. So we've met lots of paraeducators who did this on their own and it took them five, six, seven, eight years to become a teacher because there wasn't anyone there supporting them. And they had to go like through dips, you know, when they didn't have money to pay for classes, when they didn't, they had to move. And so this kind of allows someone to say, okay, I'm gonna start this program today and in two years, I'm gonna be done. I'm gonna have my degree and I'm gonna be ready to go and, and lead a classroom. And so I think for us, those are kind of always what we have kind of in the back of our mind when we're thinking about Grow Your Own and, and kind of trying to see what's going on with, with Grow Your Own in the field. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I think it's interesting um, as you kind of throughout your writing and learnings, like some of the the different, um, you know, uh, attributes and qualities. And then also thinking about in order to shift and, and do things differently, um, you know, grow your own uh, pathway models, they need to be adequately you know, funded for that that support. And so I'm hoping um, as our last question um, to to hear from you all about how are you seeing quality grow your own pathway programs funded? And Amaya, if you could share maybe a little bit about apprenticeships and the um, federal government, and then um, we can go to Conrad to talk a little bit about uh, philanthropy and Tiffany, maybe you could share a little bit about union partnerships. Okay, I'll actually also share about states because a lot of the funding that we see now comes from states and we've seen quite a few states using uh, ESSER federal recovery funds to support maybe only one time investments in GYO, but to support investments in GYO. Um, at the federal level, you know, there's many grant programs that are focused on developing educators, so teacher quality partnership grants is is one that comes to top of mind and that, that was recently awarded in the last competition it did have like a sort of a preference for, for Grow Your Own or an invitational priority for Grow Your Own. And so I think of the over 20 grants that were awarded, I think I found like six that actually are gonna be using like a Grow Your Own strategy. Um, with the funds, there's also the, the SEED grant supporting effective educator development, which was also recently awarded um, that can promote uh, these kinds of strategies. For bilingual educators, there's the National Professional Development um, Grants, which um, Diana, who's on the second panel, um, just got recently awarded her second grant from that um, to support her pathway for bilingual paraeducators to become teachers. Um, and then, you know, we have some opportunities actually in um, IDEA Part B um, to fund like scholarships and those kinds of supports for paraeducators who might want to become special um, education teachers. But I think while there are these federal funding streams, and when you talk about apprenticeship, yes, there's going to be like a hundred million dollar, um, the next round of like DOL grants will be like a hundred million dollars, and they're emphasizing that state supply for them to fund teacher apprenticeships. Um, I think the issue with the federal funds is that some of the grants have very cumbersome requirements, like you need to have matching funds or you, so whoever is applying needs to have that capacity and that kind of underlying financial structure to be able to be successful. And that doesn't necessarily work for every Grow Your Own program because I think, as we all know, some of them are very small, they're very local and they don't have like this huge infrastructure behind them that can really help them be successful in that. And so I think when we think about it, one goal that we have actually, a dream that we have would be that the federal government would find a way to subsidize and make free um, teacher preparation for anyone who wanted to become a teacher. And so Grow Your Own is sort of a, a small step to that, but as you know, we probably all know and hear, these kinds of funding cycles from states that are two-year funding cycles or from a federal grant are not always sustainable. And so how can we really build that sustainability in and rethink about the ways that we're supporting educators kind of along the continuum and that starts with making sure that they're able to 
earn a degree debt-free um, and really support their communities and be recognized as making those contributions. Thanks, Amaya, for sharing more. Conra, um, would you want to share anything quickly about um, grants that you're seeing in uh, related to Grow Your Own? Yeah, well, I just want to say, just to build off on what Amaya just shared, it's some of the characteristics that um, that she was talking about in terms of quality GYO, because of the, some of the advocacy of New America, it's actually been showing showing up in, in kind of the call for um, proposals, which I think is really commendable. And I think that that speaks to um, just the great work that they've been doing. And also it brings up for me um, an opportunity. So if we have the basic here, the cat, the characteristics that are, that are in place, um, then I think we can do more pushing in terms of looking at, well, what are the teaching and learning orientations? What are the commitments as it relates to justice and so on? And so to me, that's a bridge to philanthropy because there's great interest in educator diversity. Everybody's sort of talking about it. And I think what it does for people who have those opportunities is that they can ask the more kind of nuanced and specific research questions and designs to kind of make sure that we're tailoring it in such a way to be responsive to the localized needs, because that doesn't necessarily always come across in kind of the kind of larger um, statewide and federal grants. Um, but then also to that point, uh, it pushes that design model to think about sustainability, which I think is really important. So at the you know at that level, you can kind of develop a design that's not so much about funding immediately, but also thinking about it from a sustainable uh, from a sustain a, a perspective of sustainability. And I think that there are a lot of foundations that are doing that work. I won't shout out them all, but um, so I think that's a good time in that sense. Thanks for pointing that out. And Tiffany, would you like to um, share the last word? Uh, um, sure. The, um, obviously, you know, unions already have like partnerships in place with different organizations and um, those, you know, obviously can reach out to those, but more specifically for, at NEA, they have um, large grants like funds, and then they have smaller state and local grants that have helped some states and locals either start or develop grow your own programs. And um, we also offer some of like the Praxis supports for members who are um, trying to get into the pathway. Um, and just generally thinking like, I mean, it's just something that it's cost what around $20,000 to onboard new teachers. So, I mean, the investment in Grow Your Own programs is definitely like a cost-effective saving measure if, if they're done right. So um, trying to build those like university partnerships, um, you know, uh, but yeah, pretty much. And well, thank, thank you all for this great conversation. Yes, thank you all three of you. Um, you are just uh, foremost experts on this topic and, um, you know, with much appreciation, just listening and learning from you. And I'm gonna pass it back to Raven uh, to, um, share the next panel. Thank you, Alex. Um, that was such a good first panel, and I'm seeing that there are a lot of questions come in. Coming in, um, please feel free, even if you have questions for the first panel, still drop those in the box. Um, at the end, when we do our Q&A, we'll have time to go through all of them in order, um, and you can ask either panel any of your questions. Um, so as I mentioned before, the second panel, is all about the how of GYO and what it looks like in practice. And I'm really excited that we're joined today by four of our um, GYO Educator National Network members um, who can really speak to their actual experience with all of this and what it looks like for them. Um, so I'll start by introducing them quickly. Um, first, we have uh, Angela Hop Cruz, Director of Kalama at the Institute for Native Pacific Education and Culture in Hawaii. And then we have um, Diana Gonzalez Worthen, who's the Director of Project REACH at the University of Arkansas. Um, Diana, if I'm not mistaken, Project REACH has a new name now, um, <laughs> which can you correct me if I'm wrong? Yes, well, we're, we are completing um, Project REACH. Um, it was a, a five-year grant, National Professional Development Grant. However, we just have been awarded Project Elevate, ensuring learner equity via advocacy and teacher education. So this is going to allow us 
to continue our work for the next five years and we'll be expanding it as well. Yes. Okay. This is awesome. <laughs> um, and then uh, third, we have Laura Mogelson, Director of Multiple Pathways to Teaching at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And then finally, we have Linda Wilson, Director of Peoria, GYO, Illinois. Um, so first, just to start, and uh, we can start with Angela since I called you out first. Um, could you all briefly describe your GYO program its purpose um, and what population it serves for our viewers today. Aloha and hafari. Um, it's really great to be able to share the organization's Kalama education program and what we do as a grow your own initiative. We've been in this work for the last 24 years. We started out as a cohort model with our founders who were at the time College of Education faculty at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. As grant, um, as grant life dictates, there is an ebb and flow of funding. And so our organization's program has shifted to accommodate those needs. We are now um, no longer strongly cohorted. So we've developed informal cohorts over the years and have cast a wide net out to paraeducators, community leaders who we connect with through a community counseling approach, community conscious counseling approach. Um, and it's through that grow your own approach that we've been able to reach at this point 256 participants currently. Of the 256, a quarter of them are currently enrolled in college um, with the remaining folks exploring what pathway they should be on. And or as was mentioned by our earlier um, panelists, they, they're taking a break because they're in the sandwich generation and caring for both their parents and their children. And so as part of our Grow Your Own model, we walk them through that process. We are, the, if there is a definition picture of Grow Your Own wraparound supports, Kalama would be there. So it's mm -hmm. accessing um, financial aid for our participant students who are in high school, as well as for themselves. It's looking at finding um, kiki care to support their children in infant toddler care. It's navigating test taking. So we, we have a student who is refusing to do the practice because she missed it by two points. And so it's coaching them through the test anxiety and walking through next steps with them. And so we provide financial support um, in addition to that community counseling of 1,500 to community college and $3,000 to our UH system for your degree earners. So that's the concrete monetary support. Um, I loved what was mentioned in terms of advocacy and how are we going to get structural indicators to underscore the impact that we make. We are not a university system program. We support and partner to the best of our um, abilities with our university system folks. And so getting to um, pilot programs such as our EA58 pilot program with our huge system um, partners has been really amazing. We were able to um, move that to a state approved model. So through our pilot program with UH as we were community college, we were able to prove that investing in community teacher leaders, paraprofessionals who have been in the classroom for the past 10 to 15 years is is a model to go by. Um, and so we're right now in the process of finalizing the policies around how to reclassify an EA to a TA1, TA2. Um, and so that's another component of our GYO model is, is the systems approach. It's been really amazing um, to see that grow and evolve. Um, our systems person works closely and is, has been at all of our Board of Education meetings to identify how we can fill areas of need. 
it's been challenging to get at the table, to get a seat at the table. Um, and so our strategy is to look at what, what is Board of Education? What are our DOE leaders discussing? And where can we piggyback off of that in order to, to get a seat at the table? Um, so there's our college component, um, I spoke a little bit about our education systems component, and I'm going to move to closing the loop. So yes, we're recruiting, we're working with our folks to navigate the college system, but what happens when they get into the classroom? Super excited to talk about this growth over the last year of our professional development branch. And so we're tapping into those first year classroom teachers and providing culturally conscious curriculum and culturally conscious coaching to support those that are in the classroom. And those first year teachers are calling us, telling, telling us that they're, they're overwhelmed. Um, they're having to navigate houselessness and students who are hungry. And how do you manage all those different classroom behaviors that are a result or a symptom of those issues that are being brought in from home? Um, the professional development workshops are rooted in our place, um, specifically the YNI Coast. So we're delivering, designing cultural curriculum that marries the two and are looking forward to that being stamped and approved by the Department of Education as a four credit professional development option to launch in the summer and, and fall of 2023. So that professional development branch of Kalama has really grown and strengthened over the last year. So that the folks that we see through to the end of their teaching degree um, continue to be supported by both their education pathway coach in tandem with their professional development specialist. And so we have a STEM specialist um, who's had many years in the classroom as well as a cultural Native Hawaiian curriculum specialist who has also had many, many years in the classroom. Um, want to underscore that each of the specialists, as well as our, as our coaching team, brings to the table the gifts and assets and gems that um, Conra and Tiffany and, um, and Amaya spoke about. We're all from the community. Um, the majority of us born and raised in the Wai'anae Coast, so we understand um, the deep intimate challenges that this specific community faces. Um, and that has really made, in my opinion, um, the, the benchmark for success with engagement. Although that has been a challenge as a result of COVID, but I, I would say that that is the crux of our success is being able to connect on that level and understand the, the hunger and the houselessness and what affordability of housing um, challenges brings with, with wanting to be a teacher or wanting to remain in the field of teaching. Um, so that is our grow your own model in a nutshell. We have expanded to um, develop cohorts with the National Board Certification um, in partnership with Hawaii Teacher Standards Board and looking forward again to launching that in January. And so we're, we're currently coordinating that. So we have these, we have a full range of the spectrum from substitute to national board certification, cohort supports and everything in between. Mahalo for allowing me to share. Yes, thank you so much um, for starting us off. Uh, Linda, would you like to share next about the uh, GYO Illinois Peoria program? Hi, I'm so um, happy to be a part of this panel. And whenever I'm given an opportunity to talk about um, Grow Your Own or um, our program, it's always an exciting experience. Um, our Peoria program is a consortium um, of uh, other uh, Grow Your Own programs um, through Grow Your Own Illinois. Um, and our program specifically has a partnership with Peoria Public Schools, um, with our union. Um, I heard someone mention um, the union partnership earlier. So our union is Peoria Federation of Teachers Local 780. And um, our higher ed partner 
um, is Bradley University, although we do have good partnerships with um, Illinois Central College, with Eureka College, uh, with ISU. Um, so our we have a blended uh, cohort, um, and that essentially means that candidates um, may start on um, whatever end of the educational spectrum. So they may have um, a little college experience or they may have no college experience um, as they are joining our cohort. Um, and our mission is basically to diversify the teaching force in Peoria Public Schools um, with local folks, local individuals that have a passion to teach in our community. Um, and uh, most of the um, folks that are um, that participate in our program are peer professionals, um, although that's kind of been changing a little bit um, recently, um, but um, mainly non-traditional um, students uh, that um, are first generation um, students that need a little bit of additional support um, navigating the higher education experience and, um, and kind of discovering a pathway. Um, we have three essential components to our program. It's the social component. Um, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, uh, about some of the wraparound supports that um, our pro program pro provides, but it involves cohort meetings and um, mentoring, um, and then a lot of one-on-one -on -one FaceTime support with um, candidates. Um, there's the academic support with tutoring and, and helping candidates discover their um, academic pathway. And then it's the financial support um, that candidates qualify for up to a $25,000 um, forgivable loan, which is the um, term forgivable loan and tuition assistance are interchangeable um, while they're participating in the program. Um, we also provide other wraparound supports like uh, clinical experience stipends, student teaching stipends, um, just uh, whatever we possibly can um, to decrease whatever barrier that candidates may have um, in this journey to become a teacher. So thank you. Diana, would you like to share? Yes. Um, so we have um, our Grow Your Own program um, focuses on bilingual, bicultural paraprofessionals. Um, these are individuals at work, have been working in the school system. Some of them, you know, two years, three years, five years, 15 years. Um, and basically they have a desire to become uh, elementary teachers. Um, in our current program, Progress, uh, Project REACH, um, we were able to, 18 of them were able to graduate just this past May, and, and we were able to um, receive another five-year grant, so we're going to be expanding that, still working with bilingual, bicultural paras, but we're adding the pre-K component, so they have the opportunity, if they want to work in the area of pre-K, there's a birth to uh, birth to kindergarten certification integrated with special education. So we'll be working with another college, which we're really excited about uh, that that focuses on that uh, teacher development pipeline. Um, these uh, all of our bi bilingual bicultural um, uh, paraprofessionals, all but one English was their second language. So they're all um, they had all been English learners. It still are English learners um, you know, since day one of the program. Something else is that we have about 50% of them were born out of country and 50% were he born here. They're first generation immigrants. Um, and, um, and additionally, they what we are trying to do is to help the school district. Right now we're partnering with the largest school district, uh, Springdale Public Schools, they have the largest number of culturally and linguistically diverse students, but they also have a major um, uh, disparity among uh, diversity, uh, with the diversity component. And that's why that we have partnered with them. And that's why they were so critical um, in wanting to diversify their teacher workforce, but just uh, did not really know how to do that. Um, to give you an indication, we have um, about 91% of the teachers are white Caucasian. Um, teachers, there's 32% white Caucasian students, 48% Latino students, 4% Latino teachers, and one of our growing populations are Asian Pacific Islanders. 
0.1%. Uh, um, I think we have one in the entire district, but yet we have 14% and it's growing of students who are from uh, Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, mostly from the Republic of the Marshall Islands. And so um, with our new uh, grant, we will be expanding to, to try to build uh, this new innovative pipeline and extend it into two rural school districts who show the almost identical um, in terms of diversity, wanting to increase their teacher diversity as well. Um, so the students come through um, through our program when they, when they begin to apply to the program. One of the requirements is that they receive um, letters of recommendation, one from their principal and one from the teacher that they're working with or that knows their work in the building. And what we have found is by doing that as part of the, um, as part of the application process, um, once they become members of the Grow Your Own program, then we give them a name tag because they are a Grow Your Own um, teacher, uh, Grow Your Own candidate. And um, what that does, it really allows the entire school building <laughs> to uh, assist in shepherding the student because they, they're there working as a paraprofessional, as a teacher assistant or the parent liaison, or they might be a secretary in the building. They're in a variety of different paraprofessional roles. But once they put that name tag on and now they're, that's the, that's the teacher that we're trying to help develop. So we see it as everyone in the building along with the, with the teacher ed program and our Grow Your Own program really helping to, to nurture that. Um, our students come in for, with a variety of backgrounds as far as credits that, that was mentioned earlier. Some, this is their very first time to go to college and others they might have almost completed an Associate of Arts degree. And so um, we have a rolling admission, uh, but we do try to keep them um, in classes with at little mini cohorts of three and four students um, at a time so that they have that support around them. Um, I think I'll stop there in terms of the, the target, you know, the purpose and the population that we serve and save uh, my comments on the next question. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And then uh, Laura, could you tell us a little bit about your program? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. So I'm at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, and that's the Minneapolis and St. Paul. And we, um, the majority of our, our programs in our, um, uh, I guess, more traditional pathways at the university are uh, post-baccalaureate, full-time day programs. They are all cohort-based. Uh, we started about six years ago with this grow your own concept and have a, a kind of a three-pronged approach currently of the programming that we offer to the state of Minnesota. And the goal of this is to reduce barriers to become a teacher because of as, as has been mentioned, the teacher shortage and to help our state to diversify the teaching core because we have, like has been mentioned by others, this, this large gap um, between um, teachers of color um, and white teachers in the state of Minnesota. So we're, we're working to, to close that gap, reduce barriers and create just greater access into the field and meet the needs of all of our partners. So the programs that I run are, they are all also post-baccalaureate. So they're at the grad level. So someone has to have a bachelor's degree already uh, to, to enter our programs. Um, however, we are exploring the AA to BA pathway. It's just not something that our university has, has done in the past two decades, but we, we know that that's a tremendous need um, in order to accomplish our goals. And so we, we have a program um, that recruits paraprofessionals and then teachers that are teaching on um, not, the, not the full um, professional credential yet where they've gone through and completed a program, but they're on, a, it's sort of, a, I guess you could think of it as like an emergency waiver or a variance. They are able to be in our program because uh, we're designed in such a way that it, it caters to working adults. So evenings and weekends. And that program is specifically for our multilingual um, elementary teacher candidates or teachers who are teaching in dual language or immersion settings. We have many Spanish, Mandarin, Hmong, um, not to mention uh, Korean, Ojibwe, Dakota, French, and German schools in Minnesota. 
And so this is a, a avenue for people to earn their per, full credential and, and support districts in growing their own teachers. Uh, we have a, an, e, an ESL pathway as well that um, works to provide opportunities for, for people that are working in um, paraprofessional roles in districts who want to become a licensed K-12 English as a second language. That's what it's still called here in Minnesota, teacher. And, um, and, and so this, this pathway allows for them to go through our two-year, these are all cohort-based programs, the two-year program and earn their um, credential and their uh, master's degree. And then we're in our second year of our Grow Your Own efforts of a statewide um, partnership with an organization that's a part of AmeriCorps, which is that national service organization. And this is called Reading Corps, Minnesota Reading Corps. And so uh, members of Reading Corps can be serving anywhere in Minnesota and they can uh, enroll in our full-time grad program to earn their license and it's elementary as well uh, while they're still serving in the Reading Corps. And it's what, it's, what it is allowing us to do is uh, fund people to be in the full-time program as a grad student earning the license while they're receiving their Reading Corps, um, AmeriCorps stipend and educational award. And we can talk more about wraparound support and financial support of all those programs later, but that's a new initiative that we are in the second year of this year with our Grow Your Own efforts that's allowed us to reach the whole state because the members slash teacher candidates that are in that Grow Your Own pathway do come to campus, but it's all subsidized and funded um, by our partners. So um, I'll stop there, Raven. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's talk about wraparound supports now, um, because wraparound supports are a major characteristic of GYO programs. And so um, I just wanted to hear from all of you, what supports would your program candidates say are the most helpful for them? Do you, are you going to call on anymore? Can I volunteer? <laughs> Go ahead, jump in. I'll jump in um, really quickly. Um, so the, some of the wraparound supports that we provide is mentor, mentoring. Um, so um, we had a Grow Your Own program here um, in our school district um, maybe about 10 or 15 years ago, and I was a product of um, that program. And so um, the candidates that graduated from the program came back to the new program as being um, mentors to the new candidates that are in the program. So it's kind of a, a full circle kind of um, deal. And I would say I, I hear a lot from candidates when they've been interviewed for focus groups that the mentoring support um, helps out uh, a lot um, because candidates are dealing with a lot of um, personal issues or trying to balance their um, their home life with work life with, um, you know, college life and that kind of thing. And um, oftentimes your close family members don't understand what you're going through. And so um, the mentoring and the professional support, oftentimes uh, candidates are able to go into the mentors classrooms and do observations or get help with um, any assignments or anything like that. The cohort meetings are very essential that I hear um, because uh, candidates are um, uh, sharing their experiences with other um, candidates. They're participating in professional development um, during those meetings. Uh, they also receive child care and clinical experience stipends along with um, student teaching stipends, um, a lot of one-on-one -on -one, um, support um, where I'm contacting them every week and um, talking with them and supporting them in those ways, academic support with um, figuring out their pathway, and then um, the tutoring also for those folks that have been out of school for a while and um, kind of need to get a additional support with math or additional support, some small group support with um, passing their content area tests. Um, those are the things that I think that um, our candidates have expressed um, to myself and to others and via surveys of what is really um, important to them in terms of wraparound support. For us, I think I think one thing that that uh, our candidates would say is is very helpful in their 
and and I think it, it shows in our retention is the um, there's a single advisor that 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 they get uh, assigned to them that that's her only job is to work in the grow your own on the grow your own programs. And that person works with the candidates individually from the time they first express interest in the program. And then uh, I think Amaya mentioned the word navigator. I think that's so important, you know, and supports in navigating all the way um, until they're they're done. And, you know, then the, the it's a separate process, the licensing process, and then the, the degree process. So there's there's a, a constant person who's helping and monitoring you know, benchmarks and um, progress throughout the program. And then on the financial side, um, we work we work really hard in advocacy um, and in fundraising from philanthropy to get support for our participants. And then I work individually with each student to develop a, like a cost planning sheet and just really helping to figure out like, okay, we have these six sources of funding for you because it does get, to, I mean, there are multiple sources of funding and it's a lot to keep track of and make sure that everything is um, being, uh, you know, everything is covered and then planning for all of the costs and the testing and the ed TPA, which is, is a performance assessment required here and licensure exams and all of that. Um, and so I think those, those two things our candidates would find to be supportive in their success? Um, I think um, the, um, I wanted to mention similarly, um, we have a um, academic advisor mentor and we describe it as um, socio-culturally mediated academic advising and mentoring. This individual is with the, with the, um, with the paraprofessional from day one, starting with zero credits. So we work in collaboration with the community college. Um, and so this person, our advisor, academic advisor is, is with the, the candidate or with the potential teacher paraprofessional from day one, all the way to graduation, licensure, testing, et cetera. So, um, and they're able to communicate with her via text messaging, via email, phone calls, multiple different ways. It's And they have found that that has just been extremely beneficial because in the past um, that one of them quoted saying that they're not, you know, in the regular arena of it, academic advising, they feel like they're uh, they're just another student with an ID number, but in this case, they they feel heard and respected, and they know that their questions are going to be answered, no matter what those questions are. So having that person um, throughout is very beneficial, and that they have uh, voice voice that. The other is uh, this individual um, academic uh, advisor mentor also. Um, is responsible for um, having a monthly grow your own seminars. So everybody comes together once a month um, right after work because they're all working um, full time. And so um, in those seminars are geared specifically are very student centered. Um, one of the things that we do in the application process, uh, they have an interview and we're trying to get at their background so that we can get to know them um, very well, um, how they came here, what, you know, what, what, what were, why teaching, you know, what, what was something that, that, you know, caused you have, how long have you been thinking about becoming a teacher? Um, they are English learners. Um, they understand uh, what that means. And, um, and so they themselves, we would ask them, you know, so what are some of the barriers that you foresee, the challenges, how would you solve them? Well, all of this helps us to get the full story, you know, with the candidate, and then we're able to build uh, GYO seminars to attack each of those pieces. And so that's kind of flowing and it's adaptable. Um, and so it could be something just as um, like time management skills, uh, work, family, school balance, et cetera. I mean, the, in some of the seminars, that's what they, that's what they require. Our um, program academic advisor mentor works very closely with the academic advisor. We have one academic advisor that we work with at the community college instead of all of the academic advisors so that it's just a one on one. And that has really helped with the communication. Um, that person knows exactly where the student is in terms of the coursework that they need 
et cetera. Um, and basically the same thing that everybody else has said as far as um, you know, providing tutoring. Once they get uh, to the to the point of, of internships, um, they're of course they're not able to perform their paraprofessional duties. So the, the school district part of of what they do as, as part of their partnership, they pay they they never lose their salary. So it's paid internship. So they're just paid just like if they were there uh, during their internship. They do six weeks of internship, three weeks in the fall, three weeks in the spring. So it's split up that way. Um, and then uh, the other piece is because many of our, all of our students are first generation students. Um, we have been able to advocate for institutional accommodations as well. So um, for example, some of them didn't uh, qualify for Pell Grants because, because they had dropped all their, they did not drop their classes in time and they ended up with maybe a semester of Fs. <laughs> and so that caused them to lose their Pell Grant money. So we have been able to intervene um, with uh, financial aid recovery procedures. We've also uh, been able to intervene with grade forgiveness, which many of them had no idea what that was. And so there are just a lot of things as you go through that are potential barriers that had stopped the students if they had started a teacher uh, and wanted to become a teacher many years ago, but then it just came to a screeching halt because of many of these types of barriers. So, so I would say that these wraparound supports, you know, essentially keeping in mind that um, get, taking the time to get to know this, the students, we use an assets-based perspective. And then um, with the uh, monthly seminars that one uh, mentor advisor throughout. And then I, I wanna add one additional thing with the mentor advisor. Our mentor advisor is ESL endorsed. So she has, she has the training. She understands how to work with English learners, culturally, linguistically diverse students. And she also had worked in sheltered um, 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 immersion, uh, immersion programs with international students, English immersion programs. So she's very uh, astute when it comes to working with international students or students born out of country or English learners. So that that is very that has been very important as well. Thank you. Um, Angela, I think you're the only one who didn't get to answer yet. Um, is there a different kind of support that your program candidates would say are the most help, uh, helpful for them? I, I just echo everything that has been shared, um, the keyword being navigator. And so though we're not with the UH system, our education pathway community counselor is the bridge. We have caught a few folks who didn't meet certain requirements to transition or transfer over and are able to raise that with our um, UH system advisors and counselors. So we've we've helped to catch all so in, at, in some points. Um, and being from the community, you know, I, I bumped into, I bump into our participants at wrestling practice for our children and get information from them. You know, I didn't pass a test and then I'm able to pass that information on to their coach. And so that close connection helps us to really hold tight to folks and keep a very close pulse on what the challenges are and where to come into support. So that would be what I am sharing. Um, I didn't share at the beginning, our focus is primarily non-traditional students that are largely of Native Hawaiian descent and non-traditional can be, is debatable. And so it's not just someone who is 24, um, but it could be an 18 year old that doesn't have the financial means to attend a state tech program full time. So we help them to navigate those barriers. Thank you. Um, I know that this is probably a big question for everybody in the audience today um, about funding, uh, sustainable funding, as you know, in our GYO network is always a topic of conversation. And so um, I just wanted to ask, and. I want to start with Laura because you mentioned there are lots of different types of funding. How do you all braid and blend funding sources to sustain your GYO programs? It's a lot of work. It's very complex. Um, and it's it's had an interesting history in our state um, with 
a um, some legislative funding from over five years ago that started at um, $1.5 million to two named um, districts with, with two specific partners to now our state is up to um, $6.4 million in um, competitive grant funding that any district in the whole state can apply for and partner with any um, any approved teacher prep program. So it's just, it's opened up quite wide. And there's a, um, just last year in, in Minnesota, it was over $20 million in funding requests for, for GYO um, from districts um, with, their, with their partners. And so that's obviously one source of funding. Um, but it's challenging as the um, the prep pro the prep provider and the partner um, with just kind of how messy that can all get with um, many many districts and then many many potential partners all kind of saying all doing grow your own work uh, and then being able to um, depend upon that funding. Uh, one positive change that has happened recently was that districts now have five years to spend money that they get, so there can be a little bit more intentionality and planning and sustainable uh, and um, sustainable planning uh, around how to support uh, current teacher candidates in the pipeline and future teacher candidates in the, and to use the money to um, recruit people. Um, and then that is braided together with, with money that, that we as the university are eligible to apply for from our state that's very specific around teachers of color. And then our teacher candidates can apply for money again from our state uh, for stipends during student teaching and for teacher loan um, forgiveness programs that, that would come back later and support you know, any, any debt they might incur. But our, our biggest win um, in the past uh, two years has been securing a, a very large um, matching philanthropic gift of $1.25 million that has then successfully been matched by other donors. And so that money can be, that's 100% for students and can be used to provide scholarships. And so um, again, though, it's always, it's always uh, always on the horizon as people who run programs. You know how how are we going to keep this going? How are we going to continue to sort support people? Okay, we have this money now, but you can't just sit on that, right? You have to you have to always be thinking ahead and 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 really, um, you know, fighting the good fight of of getting the funding and and um, creating sustainability. We we run programs that are very. Um, I, we have a we we try and spend as little money as possible on you know salary and staff. So we run a real tight ship, I guess you could say, in what that looks like. But it's um, certainly the sustainability is is I think the hardest one of the hardest things um, with these with these efforts. Um. We do have time to hear from either Angela or Linda. Do either one of you have, um, is there some different kind of way or different kind of challenge that you have um, with sustainable funding that you'd like to share? For Kalama, we as a nonprofit um, are dependent currently 100% on grants, um, Native Hawaiian Education Program federal grants. Um, we receive two local grants from Kamama Schools and Office of Hawaiian Affairs, it is very uncomfortable um, because the grants run three years. Um, the two local grants are one-year grants, and so it's difficult to be able. What we're looking further into the future, but planning around a three-year grant, and so it makes it difficult to really, really push forward. We're hopeful that the grow your own funding that has been coming through with the support of New America's, um, the last con convening, we were able to expand on our partnerships and networking. We would like for the grow your own legislative language to include partnering with or subcontracting with a community-based organization, specifically in peace, to be able to as Conra mentioned often, 
bridge the inequities, address the inequities, because we come through to support with recruitment of our locally rooted teachers, um, but we don't receive the, the necessary funding to, to be an equal partner. And so that is the, the huge area of growth for us as, as a community and not just in peace, but as a community as a whole. Um, I hate to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Linda. I was just gonna um, say we're a very small program also. Um, we depend primarily um, on funding from the state of Illinois um, through Grow Your Own Illinois. And for some of the, the some of the other things, um, some wraparound um, support, like if we wanna have t-shirts for our candidates or anything else that's um, special or, you know, candidates, um, kind of struggle in terms of um, making a sacrifice of uh, not, you know, maybe they're not working during the semester or that kind of thing. So we could provide gift cards or something like that. So um, there are some local community foundations that have done some grant writing to receive some um, gas gift cards or um, any assistance with paying a bill um, if there's an emergency or something like that. Um, a matching grants from a corporation or folks that happen to work for local co corporations in our area that would be able to do some matching grants um, for that. And so, um, yeah, we're faced and it is very uncomfortable, Angela, because every year when it's grant writing time, you hold your breath because you're at the mercy of another organization and they may look at your candidates on paper as you know, just names, but you know those people very personally, and um, you want to be, create this buffer for them and um, definitely be an advocate for them because our lawmakers don't necessarily see them um, through um, the human lens that um, we as directors and coordinators do. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um... Thank you uh, to our second panel. I was going to say, I hate to end on a note about funding because even though it's a really juicy question for the audience, you know, it's a stressful question for y'all. Um, <laughs> but we are going to um, open it up now to audience questions. And these are questions that all of our panelists can answer. So um, feel free to, if you have an answer to e any one of these questions, feel free to jump in. We won't have time to get to all of them, but. Um, Hopefully we can get at least the most popular questions. I saw that some people were upvoting. Um, so the first question, and again, this is for all of the panelists from both panels. Um, one audience member asks, what options are there to support aspiring teachers who do not have bachelor's degrees yet? Are there ways to help make a path to bachelor's quicker and cheaper? We, that's what our, our program actually partners with the community college. Um, I would say that, that just in our last grant, 100% of our graduates started at the community college, or maybe they had some college credits from it from the past, but they still didn't have enough for, um, for example, the, uh, the two year associate associates degrees. And we do um, ask them to uh, complete that to complete that associate of arts degree um, and then and then they then are able to transfer at the same time uh, to the university however because um, we're confined to having our grant funding within a five-year time period just as soon as they can begin taking classes at the university they do so so there are times when they're taking classes at both the community college and the university and so we've been, been able to make that uh, flexible enough, you know, for the the transfer. But but many of ours, I think all but one had a degree. Um, no, two had degrees, but everybody else, they they didn't. So it was it was a pathway like from scratch. <laughs> so that is what we do. And, and again, partnering with the community college. Okay, um, another question from the audience. What? Oh, sorry. Sorry, Raven. Sorry. I'll just add two things to uh, to answer that question. One is community college baccalaureate programs, which um, actually my colleagues at New America have been studying quite a bit. And these programs um, uh, 
these laws and state laws actually allow community colleges to confer bachelor's degrees. And so states like Florida and Washington have many um, teacher preparation programs within community college um, colleges. And so obviously that lowers the costs, that increases access, and lots of times community colleges are better equipped to serve non-traditional students. And it eliminates that need to actually have to do the transfer. So it makes you know that process a lot smoother. Um, so I think that's one area. And the other actually would be this new push for teacher apprenticeships. So teacher apprenticeships, registered apprenticeships are degree granting programs. And so the way that they're designed is that you work as a paid registered apprenticeship while you're learning content, right? And as you show mastery of content, like, and this is like through, through courses and through like your on the job experience, you actually get paid you know, progressively higher wages. Um, and so that sort of addresses this idea that maybe you don't have a BA, but that program can actually help you earn a BA, but also help you be paid at the same time. And as you, you know, grow and know more, be paid a little bit more to, again, address some of those financial challenges to earning a degree. Um, there is another question. Uh, with an additional chunk of funding, what's the first thing you would spend it on in your GYO program? Stipends during student teaching. Does anybody else have anything they want to add? I saw some nods, so it seems like a lot of people agree with that. Stipends during student teaching. Uh, I would pay, I would ask for full tuition coverage um, at this point. It's just, yeah, full tuition coverage. I think we would pay for uh, just the internal, the op for the operations, somebody, and, and this could even be part-time, but just taking care of all the fiscal responsibilities and fiscal matters. There, there are a lot of uh, fiscal responsibilities, as Laura mentioned earlier, with, you know, look, looking at all the different funding sources and, and the grants. If you have multiple grants that are helping uh, support your program, you really need to have that person there that understands the fiscal, the budgeting, and, and all of that. So I, I know that's more internal, but it, it really, that's where the money is going to be disseminated and students will be paid their stipends and, and the like. So uh, that's an important role. I would probably say additional wraparound supports. Um, just what I was um, saying earlier, there are times when our candidates encounter some type of an emergency. Um, I had a candidate that um, had, had, was in a car accident and she was a behavioral attendant and she didn't have any um, sick days or anything like that to rely on. So she had a hard time paying her rent. And so um, I was able to help, you know, connect her with agencies that would be able to um, provide her with some assistance, but um, just kind of having some type of an emergency backup fund for candidates that are making um, extreme sacrifices to um, attend school um, and may encounter some type of life um, crisis or emergency um, that they need a little additional support that definitely falls outside of you know, the, the realm of um, what the grant says that you can spend money for. You inspired a, a thought, um, housing. So right now um, it's a million dollars for a single family home in Oahu, that's what it reached. And even I believe 40% of teachers that left the profession last year left because they left the island and so it's just um, an area that uh, another partnership opportunity that I believe grow your own um, here in Hawaii might be able to to tackle should tackle definitely and if we're if we're dreaming big and let's just pretend that there's not a substitute teacher shortage okay if that wasn't our 
truth, <laughs> um, that we would be able to more fully compensate our mentor teachers, we call them cooperating teachers who are working with our Grow Your Own um, teacher candidates because their role is so important and to be able to compensate them better and provide them with professional development around coaching, adult learning, co-teaching, um, uh, culturally competent um, practices and working with, with um, teacher candidates, uh, that would be great. <laughs> And then they could get substitute. We, you know, there could be um, pull, where they're pulled out and they do it during the day. So um, that would be nice to have funding for that too. I think that that would really honor that vital um, role. I see, I see my colleagues nodding here. Um, another question, and you know what, I'm kicking myself because I have a question that I want to ask everybody, but um, this is the audience Q&A time, so I'm not going to steal it. Um, one question our audience member had was, what do you think is next on the horizon for GYO programs? Some have been absorbed into state education agencies like Illinois. Does that de defeat the purpose or does that, does that defeat the community aspect? That's a great question and one that I've been wrestling with because I'm challenging myself to figure out how to innovate and I really believe that that might be one way, one, to address the funding challenges that specifically Kalama um, wrestles with. Is there a way to have us be absorbed? Maybe 50% of our staff is supported through um, the Department of Education Hawaii or maybe 50% of our staff is absorbed through the University of Hawaii system. Um, I don't think it would defeat because we would still have to honor, there would be no compromise in honoring that our staff is rooted, recruited from the YNI post. And I think that that again, goes back to, to everything, being able to translate, understand the intimate unique needs and be an advocate and not afraid to advocate for what our community wants and needs. Okay, I know that we only have one minute left, but I'm gonna be selfish and ask this question to have on record. Um, what data do we still not know about GYO programs? I, I can go. Um, I know Conra knows this too though. Uh, I don't know, maybe you should answer this actually based on, no. Um, so basically we don't have any national level data about Grow Your Own, how many Grow Your Own programs there are, how many people are enrolled in a Grow Your Own, the types of Grow Your Own that exist. Um, and even at the programmatic level, a lot of uh, the people who run these programs, I think most of you agree, um, because of all the work that they just described to you and having to support candidates and staffing limitations, they don't always have time to research and write about the work that they're doing. And so that's the role that I, you know, organizations like ours play, but also Tiffany at the NEA and also Connor at the, you know, University of, of Houston is, is trying to help programs document and write about their work um, so that more people can learn about these methods. But I do think, you know, there is definitely a, a dearth of, of data and hopefully, you know, the federal government or philanthropy will, will fund some more comprehensive studies that really try to look at who's in GYO, the scope of GYO, and potentially even the impact of GYO teachers on students. Um. One of the things that we're finding with the ones that just graduated, now they're teaching, is um, they're wanting to, they're, they're actually, we have a few that, that, are, that are being, they've already, they're already being shepherded or they're already being told that they would be really great administrators. And so um, I think that would be a role, like what, 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 what is it that makes them great, you know, having those characteristics um, because I think that sometimes we see that or we may not see it. 
Um, and we, and there is a shortage. I, I know in our, in our state, we, we have a shortage of diverse administrators, um, bilingual, bicultural administrators. They're just really hard to, to find, you know, in our state. So I think this could possibly be an area for that and for special education teachers um, as well. Um, th those, are, those are just a couple of things that come to mind for research. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you all so much. Um, give yourselves a round of applause and uh, thank you for all of our viewers out there who were able to spend time with us today. Um, when the recording goes out, you'll also get a resource sheet from us um, that references everything that we talked about today and all of the tools that we mentioned, including our GYO toolkit. Um, other than that, everybody have a good long weekend if you get off tomorrow. <laughs>